Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Duncan Ross from Times Higher Education. Uh, we've started the broadcast a few minutes early to give us a chance to go through a few housekeeping uh, notices before we start. So uh, there are over 70 people on the line, so we will be keeping you on mute. If you do want to ask a question, we would be, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, please use the questions facility within uh, the GoToWebinar system, and we will try and answer those as we go along. If we, if we don't answer your question, then we will try and address it in a follow-up. And we also uh, do invite questions and comments via email. The email is innovation at timeshighereducation.com. So once more, just to welcome you all to the Times Higher Education webinar on our impact and innovation ranking. Uh, thank you all for giving up your time in various parts of the world to be part of this, uh, this discussion. This is um, largely going to be covering much of the same ground that I addressed in the World Academic Summit in Singapore last week, but hopefully with a little bit of uh, further opportunity for questions and answers. So again, we'll just wait a, a few more minutes before we get into the, the detail of the presentation. One uh, additional thing to say is that all of the slides for this presentation will be made available uh, shortly after the recording, uh, after the session today, so um, if you are registered, you should receive a link which will enable you to download those. We're also recording this session, um, which means I hope I don't stumble too badly at any point. And with that, uh, I will uh, start the session formally. So again, welcome to everyone from around the world who has joined us for this presentation of the new uh, ranking the impact and innovation ranking by Times Higher Education. My name is Duncan Ross, and I'm Chief Data Officer for Times Higher Education. I had hoped to be joined by Laura, the Chief Executive Officer of Vertigo Ventures. Unfortunately, she isn't able to be with me for the morning session. However, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Mary Ho, who's joining us from Hong Kong uh, from Vertigo Ventures. Good morning, this is Mary. So uh, Times Higher Education, for those of you who are not aware, has been in the higher education space since 1971. We created our first world university ranking in 2004, uh, and we are um, a privately owned organization. We still have the magazine. We still produce uh, editorial about higher education, but we also produce data and insight. Um, and Mary, could you tell us a little bit about Vertigo Ventures? Yes, thank you, Duncan. So um, Vertigo Ventures was founded in 2009 by uh, Laura, and we have been working in this area for numerous years now with the mission to embed and empower impact reporting for a sustainable world. So we generally work with universities and HBIs internationally, mainly in UK, Australia, and Hong Kong to help them embed impact reporting as part of the business as usual. We do this predominantly through training as well as our software impact tracker, which, which some of you may be familiar with, as well as trying to, um, as well as trying to advance the gender and move it forward through, spend, um, through speaking at events and conferences. We are really excited and support the development of this new ranking. Excellent, thank you very much, Mary. So uh, a little bit more about how this fits in with Times Higher Education uh, University Rankings. So for many years, we have run the World University Rankings. We launched the 15th edition uh, just last week at NUS in Singapore. But these rankings focus very much on research-intensive institutions. 
and the measures that we look at really reflect the objectives of the research intensive university. More recently, we started exploring teaching on the international stage, looking at college rankings in the United States, in Japan, and most recently Europe. But that still left a significant gap in the objectives and the aims of universities. And that's what we are hoping to address through the impact and innovation ranking. We're currently at the end of a, um, a period of reflection on the contents of this ranking. We have some definitions and our aim is to begin data collection soon with the goal of producing a first edition early in April 2019. So the key to this really was to try and find a way of showcasing the excellent work that universities around the world are doing in terms of their broad societal impact. And when we began to look at this last year, initially we had quite a narrow focus looking at economic impact, but it soon became evident that actually there was a much bigger picture. And so we came to the conclusion that the best way we could look at this was by linking our ranking quite closely to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We like that because it gave us a pre-existing framework and one for which all of your governments are signed up. So we believe that the opportunity not just to uncover the excellent work you're doing, but to do it in a way that links to the, some of the stated objectives, both of the United Nations, but also national governments, is an important and uh, new idea. Although we are presenting um, the outline and the framework for the first edition today, it's fully expected that the ranking itself will change over time. We have to acknowledge both our own cultural biases and the fact that uh, whenever you undertake an exercise such as this, the first time you run it, you discover things when the data starts coming in. So we do expect this approach to grow over the first few years um, as we bed it down. Nevertheless, we thought it was important to actually move forward and to uh, present something to the world uh, in a reasonable time frame. I expect that most of you on the call will know what the Sustainable Development Goals are, but as a brief reminder, the Sustainable Development Goals effectively were replacements and continuations for the Millennium, Millennial Development Goals. They came into force on the 1st of January in 2016, and the idea was to have a series of quite detailed objectives and targets which could be addressed or which we could try and address as a world within 15 years. And very importantly, as part of the goals, there was this statement that actually for the goals to be reached, everyone needs to play their part. And that certainly includes the higher education sector and universities. We actually had a, uh, our first major session on the sustainable development goals was held at our Young University Summit in Tampa. Uh, earlier in this year. And whilst we were there, we asked the participants which of the 17 sustainable development goals they thought were most important to their institution. We had over 60 universities in the room, and this is the outcome. And I'm not going to look at it in detail other than to say it's no surprise that quality education was the, uh, the number one uh, sustainable development goal that universities thought was relevant to what they were doing. But as you can see here, actually there was no sustainable development goal where no universities thought it was part of their focus. Um, but it's also interesting that there was quite considerable variation across this. And one of the things we hope to be able to show in the ranking, and we'll come to this in a little, late, a little more detail in a few minutes, one of the things we hope to be able to show is how different universities in different countries and different regions are focusing on different goals, which goals are more important to countries, for example, in Southeast Asia, to those who are in, important in Latin America or Western Europe. So 
So when we started thinking about the practicalities of building this ranking, we uh, quickly came up to a theory of change, which suggests that universities can participate in driving forward the goals in three broad ways. And we describe them in these terms. So the first and most obvious way is through research. So as universities uh, research these key issues, they're creating knowledge and that knowledge in turn enables people to address some of the key issues around the world. The second way that universities can impact is through what I'm calling stewardship, being competent and or indeed excellent managers of the resources they have, whether they are human resources or physical resources. Uh, these are often the easiest things to measure. So for example, energy efficiency, um, access policies, and so on. Um, but they, and they're important because universities are often very large employers and participants in their local economy and in their cities. However, they're not the, necessarily the only way that universities can support. So the third way is what I'm calling outreach. Uh, I was trying to avoid the word impact where I could, but outreach is really the use of the university's facilities and skills more broadly in society. And as we've gone through and looked for metrics to assess, we've tried to make them match to these three broad areas. In the first year, we're going to be looking at 11 of the so, uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, and in future years, we hope to expand this to include the additional six as well, but uh, our resources were uh, limited. And so these are the areas we chose to focus on first. Each of the sustainable development goals that we've been looking at has a number of metrics associated with it. And the way that we're looking to develop the ranking is to allow universities to submit data for as many or as few as they wish. If they submit data in a minimum of four SDGs, which must include SDG 17, Partnership for the Goals, then we will include them in the final ranking, overall ranking. If they only include, if they include, uh, if they submit data for fewer than four, then they can still be ranked in that specific sustainable development goal, but they won't get an overall ranking. So as I said, we invite universities to submit data uh, where they have evidence and where they fit in with your local priorities. For each of the sustainable development goals, there'll be some data collected directly from universities and some will be provided, the research-focused data will be provided by our bibliometric partner, Elsevier. We hope to be able to use this to produce an overall ranking, um, but we also will have the ability, and I think this is quite important, to focus on individual sustainable development goals. So we can actually say, well, overall, the university that is uh, doing the most is University X, but actually within certain um, uh, within certain areas, it may be other universities are performing better. Our results will be uh, shared uh, at our summit in KAIST in Korea uh, between the 2nd and 4th of April. For those of you who are familiar with the World University Rankings, you will know that actually uh, we have some fairly strict criteria on eligibility. For the impact and innovation ranking, we want to be as open as possible. We really do want to hear from universities across the world, however, um, however far down the road as a research university they are or as a teaching university, the key thing here is about their ability to impact the world in terms of the sustainable development goals. We do have a, a couple of rules. They are very light touch. Firstly, we are looking at universities. So we do require some teaching of undergraduates. And we also want the university to be accredited by their local accreditation body. We will probably be willing to accept data from outside the group, but we may choose not to include them in the rankings. So for example, we would be delighted to see some data from the Max Planck Institutes in Germany, 
but um, we don't think that uh, what we're looking at will perfectly match the data they'll be able to provide. The time period we're looking at is the academic year uh, most closely linked with the uh, chronological year January to December 2017. And uh, the full methodology, the full details of the data that we're after is being put together by my colleague Bearbell and will be available within our data collection portal. If you don't have access to the data collection portal, please email us on innovation at timetowereducation.com and we can set that up. A couple of important considerations. Um, although uh, we are collecting a wide range of data, we reserve the right not to use it um, in the event that the data we collect uh, we believe is of low quality uh, or has uh, variations that we weren't expecting, we may have to revisit some of our ideas after the data comes in. Another important uh, thing to consider is that we do want to reward visibility. So uh, in a couple of occasions, for example, we will ask you to provide uh, or ask you to tell us if you have a policy on X. When we do ask you for a policy, we would like you to submit evidence that the policy exists. If that policy is available on a, an external, externally available link, that is the preferred mechanism, or you will be able to email uh, documents to us. Any documents you do email, by the way, you will retain, absolutely retain copyright to. We will be using them for analysis purposes only. We will give extra credit, by the way, for externally visible evidence. We believe this is an important part of holding universities up to account. We know that if you say that you have a policy and you publicize it, then there is much more chance that you adhere to the policy and that the policy is actually effective and works effectively. Uh, when we collect this kind of data, this will be through a mechanism that we're calling a pick list. So for some of the metrics, we will have a continuous variable. So for example, the proportion of graduates who do X. For others, we will have a list of uh, things that we're looking for, and those will be effectively a checklist. You will say, yes, we have this policy, no, we don't. Uh, and if you do, here's the evidence. We reserve the right to uh, not to weight all elements on a pick list equally, and we'll be adjusting that again according to uh, things such as data quality and completeness, as well as our views on the relative importance of elements within that pick list. So what will we actually be measuring? As I said, um, we'll be collecting data around 11 of the 17 sustainable development goals. But please remember, you don't need to supply data for all of the goals. If you just have data for one of those, that would be absolutely wonderful. There are uh, this is uh, a little slide to kind of frame how we've gone from the, social de uh, the sustainable development goals to our metrics. There are 17 sustainable development goals. And within the UN framework, these have been broken down into 169 specific indicators. The good news about those indicators is that they are fairly detailed. So that helps us when we've been designing our metrics. Uh, the bad news is that they aren't always focused or indeed sometimes at all focused on the work that universities do. So we've gone from the 169 indi sorry, the UN goes from the 169 indicators actually to 223 unique targets. These are the elements that the, the UN hopes we will achieve or presumably exceed by uh, the end of the uh, SDG process. On our side, uh, for the first edition, we're focusing on 11 of those 17 SDGs. And those are directly linked to the 17 SDGs in the UN document. They are a one-for-one -one match. So if you have uh, questions about uh, the objectives, what we're trying to measure, uh, it's always useful to go back to those UN documents. There are lots of resources out there that can help you see the direction that the UN is, is trying to go in. The 11 SDGs uh, on our side are then broken down into 47 metrics. Now remember that not all of those are metrics that universities have to supply data for. Uh, approximately um, a quarter of those are 
directly fed by information from Elsevier. And uh, again, remember, you don't have to supply data for all of those to be included in the ranking process. Beneath those 47 broad metrics, there are 111 measurements. And this is where the, the link becomes slightly weaker. Those measurements do relate to the unique targets. And in these slides, we've tried to give some indication of where that's the case. Um, but there's not always a one-for-one -one match there. We've tried to get them as close as possible, uh, but it's not possible to uh, perfectly match the 223 unique targets. So for the remainder of the presentation, uh, and I'm going to try and leave um, about 10 minutes at the end to take some of your questions. But for the remainder of the, of the presentation, I'm going to step through the 11 SDGs that we're looking at and uh, give you at least a high level indicator of the metrics that we are measuring. For some of those, I will go into more detail to give you a feel for the, the more detailed data that we're looking for. But hopefully this will give you a good starting point to understand the depth and type of data that we're looking to collect. So the first one that we're looking at is SDG3, Good Health and Wellbeing. And the United Nations described this as, uh, or the goal of this, to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. There are three metrics that we're looking at in, um, in this, uh, this one. Uh, the first metric is coming from Elsevier, is looking at uh, research. Uh, the second metric, uh, the number of uh, of graduates who are graduating in health profession, professions will be provided by universities. And then finally, we'll have a pick list around health impact. So looking at those in a little more detail, and uh, the, the, new, the numbering uh, scheme I've used for this uh, for our metrics is three dot, is number dot Roman in lowercase. I've done that to try and stop confusion with the UN's own numbering system. So you can see in the targets area there, uh, there are a number of clear uh, UN target numbers. So you can look up those in more detail if you wish. For 3.1, we'll be working with Elsevier to collect appropriate data on research. One of the strengths of the of the SDGs in this particular aspect is that they provide quite a lot of detail at, in terms of the areas that are being focused on. So within the SDGs, they specifically mention a number of areas. I haven't listed all of them here, but these are some of the ones that, are, that I can pull out very easily from the United Nations documentation. So it's not necessarily that they are looking at research across all health topics. They're particularly looking for the health topics which have the biggest impact, particularly in uh, parts of the world which have uh, lower income profiles. So aspects like maternal mortality, malaria, HIV, tropical disease, and so on. Because we're working with Elsevier, we have the ability to do some quite detailed analysis here. Um, we haven't determined yet exactly which measures we shall use for this. My feeling is we want to move towards the more practical measures. So although within the World University rankings, we tend to focus on citations as being the most important factor, we're certainly looking at other alternative measurements. One of the key ones in the health professions might actually be downloads. So are these documents actually being used? Are they being read rather than necessarily are they being cited? Um, so. Uh, this gives us the ability to build something quite flexible, but also very, very focused in that area. Uh, the second metric within uh, SDG3 is linking to target 3.C.1. And really, it's trying to understand the degree to which universities are providing uh, the health professionals that their countries need. So here we'll be looking at the proportion of graduates in health professions, um, looking at the number of graduates in the most recent year. So um, for this, we will um, specify the year, we will specify the type of degree, and also give examples of the 
of the potential degree areas that uh, might be covered. Clearly, we don't know all of the courses that your universities are uh, running. Um, so we will allow universities, as long as they're clear about which courses they're including, we will allow universities to specify those to match their local requirements. It's also important to note that we're not necessarily looking for courses that enable a student to practice directly. We know that for many health professions, there are uh, additional, uh, uh, additional certifications that are required before uh, graduates can actually practice, but we want to explore how far universities uh, are feeding that, uh, that funnel of health research. And that's a good example of a continuous variable or continuous metric. Um, the third element or the third metric in uh, SDG3 is an example of a pick list. So here we have five discrete things we're looking at. And for each of those, we're exploring um, a number of different factors. So the first one is, do you have current collaborations with local or global health institutions to improve health and well-being outcomes. Uh, the second one is, do you deliver outreach pro programs and projects in the local community? The third one is looking at sharing the uh, sports facilities that you may have with the local community. Um, and then the, the fourth and fifth one, looking at the degree to which you support students, firstly in terms of sexual and reproductive health, uh, and then uh, looking at the degree to which you support students and staff with access to mental health support. So in each case for these, we would ask you to, um, to tick a box to indicate you do or do not do one of these things, but also to provide evidence where you do. And as I mentioned earlier, that evidence could be uh, in, uh, for example, a link to uh, an online document, or it could be a specific document that you email to us where appropriate. I'm going to spend slightly less time on the other ones, but I wanted to walk through that to give you an example of the scope of things we're looking at. Um, the, the next SDG is SDG 4, Quality Education, uh, ensuring inclusive and quality education for all and promoting lifelong learning. It's interesting that when you look at the way the UN has framed this, there is very clearly a focus on early years provision and also on lifelong learning. And we've tried to reflect that in the metrics we're looking at. So here we're looking at four metrics, uh, research into education, into ped pedagogy, uh, the number of graduates with primary school teaching qualifications. So it's again, it's the proportion of graduates that you feed into the funnel to support um, early years education in your country. Uh, a pick list of lifelong learning measures, and then um, the proportion of first generation students. And really there, we're trying to understand the degree to which you are genuinely providing educational opportunity across the spectrum in your particular countries. I'm not gonna look at all of these, but um, just looking at the lifelong learning measures, the pick list here is, uh, do you provide access to educational resources for those not studying at the university? We want to understand whether that access is free or charged, whether or not you host events uh, on campus that are open to the general public, uh, whether or not you undertake educational outreach activities beyond campus. So we've said, you know, do you welcome people onto the campus, but also do you reach out beyond there? And then very importantly, item D, do you have a policy that ensures that access to these activities is accessible to all? Now, when we ask for policies, we are going to ask you to provide evidence of when the policy was created, but also importantly, when that policy was last reviewed. Uh, it's uh, my, my experience in, in local government uh, several years ago uh, was very much that where policies are created, but then uh, never looked at again, they are far less effective when they are under regular review. So we do want to look at that. Uh, proportion of first generation students, again, this is really a, a very interesting measure. This is one that we have used in our teaching rankings before. And it really does give us a good understanding of the degree to which universities are genuinely addressing uh, the cross-sectional issues of access within their 
uh, country because first generation students cuts across uh, a number of areas of disadvantage, including ethnic, including gender, and including economic. So it's, it's a very powerful metric. The, uh, the next SDG we're looking at is gender equality. And when the UN is talking about this, they, uh, they're being very clear that they're looking at um, gender equality in terms of addressing the needs of women and girls. So the, the phrase that they use is achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And we hope that the metrics we've picked reflect that. There are rather more metrics in this particular area. Um, again, as before, research coming from Elsevier. Uh, we are going to be looking at the proportion of first generation female students. So this is a, uh, uh, a slightly different take on the same information that we were gathering in four. So the proportion of first generation students who are female. We then look at access measures. So what work is the university doing to ensure that women can access the university? We'll be uh, in 5.4, we will be evaluating the degree to which your university is actually supporting women in their ability to get to the top within higher education. Uh, we Again, we know from our work in the European teaching ranking that there are some challenges for some of the most research intensive universities around this particular measure. We saw in the UK a slight but fairly clear inverse correlation between the resources available to a university and the proportion of women uh, in senior positions, and that's our uh, proportion of women in the university. And that was quite an interesting reflection. We, we're very interested to see if that is also reflected in this data. Um, we'll be exploring the admissions gender mix, and when we do that, we will be balancing it by uh, broad subject areas. So we're trying not to disadvantage universities that have a, a strong technical uh, focus. Um, so the admissions gender is important. And then the final measure here is looking at policies that support women when they're at university. Uh, so the difference there between the access measures, the access measures, how do women get to university? The policies here are looking at how we ensure that women are treated equ equitably once they have uh, got to university. So looking in slightly more detail at the access measures, so the first one is to, uh, to really encourage universities to actually track and measure application and acceptance rates. Uh, if universities don't do that, then it's very difficult for them to, um, to actually move further. So um, we do have someone who's put their hand up. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, Alec, if it would be possible to ask the question um, around uh, on the, on the uh, on the webinar system, then we will try and answer it directly that way. Um, thank you. So the second access measure is um, making sure that you're actually, uh, that universities are actually using evidence around specific local challenge, uh, local issues to address unequal participation. Um, the third one is having policies looking at uh, acceptance rates and participation. The fourth one is, uh, is going beyond that and actually directly providing access schemes, which and we've suggested three, well, two different elements, uh, mentoring and scholarships are obvious ones, but there may be others and we would like to, to um, understand those. And then the fifth one is one that is, is very important to my heart as someone who is focused in, um, in the STEM side of the world, uh, is encouraging applications by women in subjects where they are underrepresented. And we know that this isn't purely the, the responsibility of universities, but we do think that universities have a crucial role to play in ensuring that uh, women and girls are encouraged to apply across the range of subjects. Uh, the other side of this, the positive policies that we hope will indicate whether universities are appropriately supporting universe, uh, women in university. Uh, obviously, policies of non-discrimination against women we are also asking about non-discrimination for transgender people. Although transgender people are not specifically mentioned in the UN Sustainable Development Goal, we think it's important that 
uh, their issues are reflected here. And we've separated this from the uh, policy of non-discrimination against women for clarity. The third one, looking at maternity and paternity policies that support women's participation. Uh, Childcare facilities for students so that we don't have situations where young mothers are effectively unable to continue the, their higher education. And indeed, childcare facilities for staff and faculty as well. Uh, we're asking about women's mentoring scheme, uh, tracking of graduation rate. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to look at that because the evidence at the moment is that women are actually more likely to graduate than men. So it's, an, it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting metric to evaluate. Um, and then finally, a uh, looking for a policy that ensures that uh, where we do have anti-discrimination policies, that uh, when or if women report challenges or issues, that they are not then uh, disadvantaged in terms of future employment opportunities. Looking at SDG number eight, so SDG number eight, decent work and economic growth is about promoting inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work. Five metrics here, again, research from Elsevier, a pick list around employment practice at the university, a measure of inward investments. Now we could have made a very complex calculation here for the first version, we're going to use a relatively simple calculation, but we are going to balance this by the GDP um, of a local area so that a university that is bringing money in to an area which is otherwise relatively poor will get additional credit there. Employment placements, so looking at the, uh, the degree to which universities provide uh, opportunities for their students to learn about the world of work through practical placements. And then a measure employment security, which looks at the pre precariousness of higher education employment. So in, in terms of employment practice, I'm not gonna go through all of these in detail. You will have a copy of these slides, so you'll be able to look in more detail later on. Uh, but we are looking at things like uh, discriminate, ensuring there is a policy against discrimination, that the university is committed to uh, be against forced labor, against modern slavery and human trafficking and child labor. Um, and one of the ones I think that's quite interesting from my perspective is looking at ensuring that when you outsource services to third parties, that you actually ensure that the third parties are also good employers. The security of employment uh, measure is, is worth looking at slightly more. So uh, this has been an issue that is has been growing as uh, an issue for universities over the last few years, with increasing numbers of faculty and staff on short-term contracts. Uh, we thought it was important for us to try and reflect the role of a university as a good employer. Uh, it's quite challenging to build a metric for that. Our first attempt is looking for the proportion of university employees who are on employment contracts which last for less than two years. We think this is going to give us a measure of the, the proportion of universities where staff or the proportion of a university where staff are in a relatively uh, economically precarious position. Now, the one exclusion here is that clearly we don't want to penalise universities for having good maternity cover. And so uh, contracts which are explicitly to cover maternity leave or paternity leave are excluded. The ninth SDG, this is uh, one which is closest to what we already look at in the World University Ranking. And indeed, last year we gathered some additional data around this particular SDG, although we didn't take it forward last year. So this is looking at building infrastructure, uh, sustainable industrialization, but also importantly, fostering innovation. So I'm not gonna look in detail at this, but I am going to uh, explain this. Two of the metrics here, uh, would come from Elsevier, one around research, but the other one looking at patents. So one of the uh, one of the things that we can do with Elsevier is look more broadly than just at traditional academic publishing. And in this case, by looking at patents, we can explore the broader reach of innovation. We'll also be looking at the number of spin-offs that universities generate. So again, a measure of innovation. 
And then finally, we'll be looking at industry income. We'll be using the same definition we use for the World University Ranking. So those of you who already submit data through that process should be able to get access to this data quite straightforwardly. It's looking at income that supports research that doesn't come through central government. So it's funded by commerce or by industry. SDG 10, uh, reducing inequality within and among countries. So again, we're looking for quite a range of uh, different things here. Uh, the first, again, is looking at research in this area. Uh, the second one, you'll note this is identical to the metric we had in uh, SDG number four, the number of first generation students. So again, if you are already recording that in, um, in SDG four, this is the same measure here, but of course we're looking at a slightly broader outlook. Uh, we're looking at the percentage of international students from developing nations. A little bit more about that in a moment. And then two measures which look at uh, equalities or inequalities with respect to disability. This is the only SDG which really addresses disability directly. And we did think it was important to understand how well universities are supporting students and staff with disabilities. And then finally, we have uh, a series of measures again that look at access to universities. So when we look at the percentage of overseas students from developing nations, uh, there is one slight change that we've made to this definition following discussions with the Association of Commonwealth Universities and various other groups, uh, which is that we're now going to, going to be slightly more precise. So what we're looking for here is the proportion of first degree students who come from countries that are classified as having low income or lower middle income by the World Bank and who receive financial support. So they have to be from those geographies and they need to receive financial support. The goal here is really to focus the degree to which any university is reaching out to provide an international education to people from the countries that most need that support. And the, the map you can see here looks at the, uh, this is actually slightly out of date, by the way, this is from the 2016 data, but it was the, the best map I could find that didn't require me to color in the countries by hand. Uh, this gives you an idea of the countries we're looking at. So we're looking at the red and the orange countries typically. So it includes India, uh, much of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, some of the Central American countries, uh, Venezuela, there is as well, for example. Sorry, uh, Guyana there as well. So uh, we think that's going to be an, uh, an interesting variation on the metric that we have in the World University Ranking, but very much more focused on how universities support uh, inequality across the world. In terms of access to university, again, looking at admissions policies which are non-discriminatory, um, so I've broken these down into three areas, looking at um, admission across the spectrum of different, uh, different cross-sectional issues, um, how you deal with uh, people once they're within the university, uh, and then looking at uh, a broader role of how you support students, but also how you educate more broadly to ensure that students and faculty are supported across their university careers. Moving on, because I am running out of time and I do want to get to the end of this, um, SDG 11, making cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Um, the nice thing about this from, from uh, THE's side is that many of the SDGs tend to focus on STEM or medicine areas which are important, absolutely. But uh, this is one of the SDGs that also looks at the role that the arts can provide in terms of supporting uh, the, uh, the communities that universities are placed within. And so we will have two measures here looking at the degree to which universities are custodians of the living heritage of their nations and their regions. Um, and then item four, sustainable practices uh, that's looking at the things that more conventionally come to mind when we think about sustainability. So aspects like uh, ensuring that you have ad adequate um, uh, adequate 
transportation uh, and low carbon transportation. So here we see, yes, uh, looking at sustainable commuting, uh, promoting uh, affordable housing for students and employees, uh, working with local authorities to address planning issues, uh, brown, using brownfield sites for buildings and so on. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. Again, the four metrics here, research around this, an operations pick list, um, the proportion of waste recycled. So this is, you can view this one in two ways, either the proportion recycled or the proportion that effectively doesn't have to go to landfill. And then um, the publication of a sustainability report. Uh, this is one of the ones which actually links measures that links most precisely to the SDGs. That is a specific target within the SDGs is increasing the number of organizations who produce sustainability reports. SDG 13, taking urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Here we're looking at, at three broad areas. Again, looking at research. I think this is one of the areas where the research that the university do is perhaps most important of all. But we also want to understand um, the carbon footprint of universities. Are they being, uh, are they doing their best to reduce their carbon impact? Uh, have some even re uh, reached carbon neutrality? <coughs> and then the third element there is one of the aspects of this SDG, which is an acknowledgement that some of the uh, some of the impact of climate change cannot be avoided. And so there is an important role for universities to participate in planning for how society copes with and deals with the, uh, the now almost inevitable outcomes of climate change. So looking at environmental education and disaster planning. The carbon footprint measurement is one of the ones which I'm kind of looking forward to the most, although it's going to be very challenging. And this is looking at, uh, because this requires universities really to be able to give a breakdown of the energy that they use. Uh, I would love it if universities were able to supply this data in kilojoules and tell me what proportion came from renewable resources or low carbon sources. But actually we know that um, not all energy is consumed in that way. So we'll be asking universities to provide energy consumed by the type of energy used, so for example, coal, natural gas, et cetera. And then I will be doing back office calculations to convert that to uh, gigajoules so that I can then uh, evaluate the proportion which is coming from low carbon sources. So that's going to be a nice mathematical challenge for me, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, the last two SDGs, and then hopefully we'll have some time to talk through some questions. So SDG 16, promoting just, peaceful and inclusive societies. This is an area which, um, which I do think that universities have a, a key role here uh, to play. And the first one is by providing um, research both around uh, legal aspects, the law, but also international relations. The role that universities can play in exploring and investigating these very challenging real world problems is uh, can't be understated. But universities also have a, an important role to play looking internally. Universities need to be well governed. They need to be governed for the benefit, not just of their, uh, uh, the academy, but also of society more generally. And so we'll be looking at a governance pick list. We'll also be looking uh, for evidence of the way that universities participate both in their local government, their regional government, and the national government. And then finally, we'll be looking at the proportion of graduates uh, in law and in civil enforcement related courses. And then uh, the final SDG uh, that we'll be looking at, and this is the one that, that we want all universities, if at all possible, to provide data in it, particularly if they want to be in the overall ranking, is looking at partnership for the goals. So the first measurement here, the proportion of all social de uh, uh, sustainable development goals with international co-authorship. 
as with the international students, we're looking at co-authorship with the universities that are based in low income or low middle income countries. Uh, the nice thing about the uh, about the Elsevier data set is that we can do this uh, across all of the sustainable development goals, not just the ones that we're measuring directly already. Um, we're also going to look at uh, a pick list of relationships with uh, non-government organizations, uh, with regional and national governments. In the description I, I put here that we may remove this, we're, we're still uncertain whether we will include this. My feeling at the moment is yes, we will. We do think that the the role that universities can um, provide as expert witnesses in forming policy debate uh, around the SDGs is, is really crucial. Uh, in 17.3, we'll be asking universities to provide evidence that they are publishing outputs across all of the sustainable development goals. And we will give additional credit where that output is being provided in an open data format. Um, again, this goes back to our, our firm belief that one of the ways that universities are going to continue to see this work as important is if they publish the data and that data is held up and they are accountable for it. Uh, when you do that, you tend to want to make sure that you do better in subsequent years. And then the final measure that we're looking at within the, uh, the overall outlay is um, a survey of influencers. And we're working with uh, YouGov, who are a polling organization, to try and generate an international panel uh, that will allow us to explore where universities are perceived as having the biggest impact across the sustainable development goals. And I, I should emphasize this will be worldwide, and we will not proceed with this if we do not think that we can get a sufficiently global um, and representative panel and also a panel that actually has genuine experience in this area. So we are looking, for example, at um, some of the big uh, NGOs, well, and not necessarily big NGOs, some of the NGOs who are out there doing work on the ground to see where they see value from the higher education sector. Um, a little bit about next steps, and then when we, I promise I will answer some questions, I'm sure there have been one or two. So clearly there is further work. We uh, have yet to address six of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we're committed to, uh, to doing that in subsequent editions of the, uh, of the output. And those, just to be clear, are SDGs 1, 2, sorry, 1, no poverty, 2, zero hunger, 6, clean water and sanitation, 7, affordable and clean energy, uh, 14 life below water and 15 life on land. The way that we chose which ones, which SDGs to include and exclude uh, was partly based upon the survey we ran at Tampa, also partly done based on uh, the obvious links to the work that universities are doing and our ability to develop out uh, at this stage what we thought were going to be relevant indicators. Our timetable is fairly um, aggressive. Uh, we're launching it. We've launched the rankings officially um, last week in Singapore. We will uh, hopefully be opening our data collection portal, which will contain all the detailed guidance for data submission. Uh, we hope to open that in mid to late October, and that will remain open until December. We will also have our team of uh, support staff here in Times Higher Education who will be available to uh, answer questions because we're certain that as data, as people start filling in data, there will be numerous questions about uh, definitions, what to include, what to exclude. Uh, whenever we get those questions, we try to recycle those into a frequently asked question document so that as time goes by, the definitions themselves become more precise and more fitted to different geographies. The calculation of the, of the uh, first edition will then take place uh, over winter, with the release of the first results, hopefully in April 2019. And this isn't, uh, you know, we don't believe for one moment that we will get this right the first time, but we hope it will still provide really useful insights, but we will review this uh, going forward after the publication of the first uh, edition with the intention of making it better and stronger and a more accurate reflection of uh, universities around the world going forward. 
We haven't come to final conclusions about how we will present the results, by the way, so there are a number of options available. Uh, one of the ones that was suggested last week was looking at separate uh, listings for universities in the global north versus global south, and that's something that is uh, potentially there. I think I'd like to see how universities do before we make that decision. I genuinely hope that we can see some universities shining here who are not just the usual suspects. Uh, there's no particular reason to think that the, the Ivy League will be especially good uh, or especially poor in this area. So uh, there's lots of hope for the future. And with that, um, we can start to look at some of the questions that may have come in. So um, I'm grateful to my colleagues in the room who've been fielding, uh, trying to field um, some of these. Um, so 3.2, what about majors? So this is, I expect, from an American um, American colleague. So um, uh, yes, we'll, uh, when it comes to university systems which are more open, yes, we'll, prob we'll have definitions which will support you in understanding um, exactly what we're looking for there. So yes, the likelihood is that, that majors would be relevant to those particular questions. And we will also provide much more clarity and precision about when metrics relate to staff, when they relate to students, and also clarity around the definition of staff. That, that um, This does cause confusion across the world because in the UK, for example, we tend to refer to academic staff. In the US, we tend to refer to faculty and so on. So we will try and be as clear as we can in the definitions about precisely what we're trying to measure. The same is true for when we talk about student numbers. Are we looking for full-time equivalent or are we looking for headcount? Um, so uh, does, the question here from, uh, from Tanya Wilman says, does the support have to come from the studying institution or can it come from government or other sources? It could come from either. Uh, for some elements such as policies, we expect it to come from the university because the policy is owned by the university, but external uh, validation would be, would be excellent to see. Um, uh, for SDG3, so uh, Jean-Marie uh, um, said, uh, for SDG3 health degrees, physicians, will you consider if the university provides only courses for first year of medical studies? Yes, the goal here isn't necessarily to narrow you down to only those degrees which would allow someone to practice. So if you are uh, feeding the funnel, that would fit within the definitions we're looking at at the moment. Uh, a good question here from um, Rosanna uh, Kutomason. Um, how are you going to moderate for, moderate for university size? So where possible, we tend to look at ratios. So this is a problem that we deal with uh, fairly regularly within the world university rankings. So most of what we're looking at in terms of measurement will be a ratio. So for example, the proportion of students. Um, and we hope that, that will balance for, for some aspects of size. And certainly when we look at bibliometric measures, again, we will make sure that this is uh, balanced by the size of uh, the university. Um, uh, and uh, Yes, uh, com uh, PDF file send. Yes, if you uh, so the system itself, when you submit data, if you say that you want to submit a document, it will generate an email frame for you using a mail to uh, approach, and then you can attach uh, a document in whatever format. We're encouraging text documents rather than video and audio files for obvious space reasons, but a PDF document would be ideal. Now we do have um, some hands up. This is going to require a bit of technical work. Um, from uh, my my team of people. So, for, if possible, the people who put your hand. Uh, ah, you hello. Uh, yes, if you could, if you could. Um, so, Alec uh, Lisa, I hope I haven't mispronounced your name. Hello, Alec. Hello. Hello. Alex is still on mute. Um, we try... Well, in, in that case, could we, could we move on? We'll try and unmute you in a, in a second, Alex. Um, uh, Jasmine Killett. 
Can we unmute Jasmine? Uh, we have unmuted her. Um, Jasmine? So I think she has a question here as well, um, asking, uh, will, will we take the number of students and staff into considerations and give weight accordingly? So um, I think this relates to my, my earlier answer about um, trying to ensure that we don't um, give a, an advantage to large rather than small universities. So uh, yes, where, where it makes uh, sense, we will try and design the measures in a way that um, account for some of that. So um, for the, particularly for the continuous measures, I think for the pick list measures, actually size is less of a challenge in terms of the, the raw number of students. Um, these are things we think that universities should be doing anyway. Um, we did, whilst we were trying to design the metrics, we, we did do our best to try and think of metrics which wouldn't simply advantage universities with large infrastructures, but there are, um, there are limitations to how well uh, we, can, um, we can do that, but we will try that wherever possible. Um, so, uh, Karma Rana, uh, if if you can speak, please do ask a question. I'm I'm not convinced our, our mechanism for getting people to ask is necessarily working. Alec, Alec, oh, Alec. oh hello, Alec. Estonian. Welcome. Good, mo good morning. I'm 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 in transit, so apologies if there's any background noise. Alec Worst in Glasgow Caledonian University. My question relates to uh, SDG 4 uh -huh. and I, I understand that there is a, a metric that's related to providing education with regards to sustainability education and understanding of sustainability. And as you know, there is a, um, a global movement called the, under the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education with 700 um, signature institutions. Um, and I'm trying to understand uh, perhaps why this metric, which seems central to educating uh, graduates for the future, why it doesn't seem to figure, or at least explicitly. No, I think, thank you, Alec, that's a, that's a good question. We did explore how we could measure the degree to which uh, the SDGs as a whole were embedded in curricula because that's really what we're talking about is yes, the effective yes, teaching right. of people towards it. Um, and it really is, you're correct, the only place, interestingly, the only place that curricula is specifically mentioned within all of the SDGs from memory is, is 4. Point, I think 4.7.1 from memory. Yes. Um, yes. And which, which is quite odd. I would have expected it to be woven throughout. Now, in the end of the day, this simply came down um, to a practical challenge, which is how do you sensibly measure not just uh, is something embedded in the curricula, but is it being taught effectively? Um, we've seen through business schools, for example, that there's been a, a big focus, uh, allegedly, on uh, teaching the ethics of business. But the question, of course, is how well does that, is that reflected in business practice of the alumni afterwards? So, mm -hmm. For the first edition, and I must emphasize this is just for the first edition, we chose not to include that. But we do recognize, absolutely, Alec, I would back you up on this, we do recognize that in the longer run, we need to find a way of including this in future editions. I would like to see, um, I would like to see something that actually weaves it through all of the SDGs. I, I think that just putting it in 4.7 really underplays the importance. Um, mm -hmm. but if you have any concrete ideas about how we can do that, uh, we'd be delighted to, to extend this conversation around that. Okay. So, so yes, it's, right. it's not Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll... It, it, so yeah, if you can email us with ideas or, or um, we would be delighted to hear from you. Okay. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks. Um, so uh, moving on, Karma, uh, are you able to speak at the moment? Uh, uh, th uh, thank you, Duncan. Uh, this is Karma. I'm here with my colleague, Ms. Eisel. Uh, wonderful presentation. 
uh, we, we, we are uh, from the Asian Institute of Technology. We are a purely postgraduate institution working very closely on the uh, SDGs. And we have been taking part in the uh, Times Higher Education data submission through the portals. But uh, we are a purely postgraduate institution. And we uh, were wondering, uh, since this is a new impact ranking, uh, will the under, why is the undergraduate uh, exclusion criteria still there? And how can institutions like AIT take part? Thank you. No, another great question. So um, part of the reason that the, the undergraduate teaching is there is because um, we wanted to reflect uh, the, the sort of broad universities rather than research institutions, at least initially. I've got to say, if we get sufficient um, responses from um, research institutions, then we can always produce a separate element that removes some of the some of the aspects that are very much focused around undergraduate education in the metrics. And so I think if we, if we do get sufficient research institutions submitting, then we would, I would be delighted to do that. Um, but the, I think there is a slight challenge that there is a slight mismatch in some of the things we're looking at. Um, the other thing I'd add, though, is that uh, one of the advantages we have at Times Higher Education is that uh, we also have uh, the magazine and the website. So I have a team of 30 or so editorial staff. Uh, well, I don't have a team. My editor has a team who are really interested in this whole subject area and we will be supporting this with articles that explore the degree to which universities and higher education institutions really are driving this forward so um, even if we aren't able to rank you overall because of these issues i do think that uh, that that ability to produce analysis outside that is still something that's really important and could give you visibility but i I'm sorry if this sounds a bit of a kind of um, uh, bit of a wishy-washy answer. I, I think it will depend on how many uh, HEIs outside the pure uni or the broad universities submit data. Um, also, to be honest, if it's successful in its first year, if we get a lot of involvement, then we may well, for subsequent years, actually end up splitting that apart more formally and having uh, having um, part of this that looks much in much more detail at uh, pure research institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dante. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, uh, we also have um, uh, Angela. Angela Osu Ansa. Angela, are you? Are you? Hi, this is Angela. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I represent Ashasi University in Ghana. Um, I have two questions. Is that, is that okay if I ask them both? Yeah, please ask them both. Yes. Okay, so I understand that if you have data for a particular SDG, that's going to be considered. What if you have components of that and not necessarily, um, you know, that it's, the data is lacking, but aspects of the metric, uh, what you do, would that be still considered in the um, calculations that you have? And then my second one is we're a relatively new university we're 16 years old we have certain measures in place but we just got our charter in june so we are now in the process of developing our policies would that go against us we do have evidence of us working and doing most of the things you were saying but i don't think that we have them as formal um written policies yet we are now in the process of doing that so um in terms of partial data submission yes we, we expect that there are many universities who will be able to provide some information but not all information um, uh, by the way a little bit about the way that we are proposing to the calculation so what we don't want to do is uh, essentially reward um, let's, I'm going to choose a random university here, so uh, this is not a, a saying that they're a bad university, they're a great university, but we don't want to necessarily reward Oxford University just because they have the capacity to answer in all 11 SDGs. So they don't, no. so because we, we, that would clearly weight this towards universities that had, were old and had lots of infrastructure. So what we will do is that 
uh, when a university submits data around the SDGs, we will take the top four SDGs for that university. So if your top four SDGs are SDG 3, 8, 9, and 11, sorry, oh, we, we will include 17 as well, sorry, so 3, 8, 9, and 17, then those are the ones that we will use to include you in the overall ranking. So as long as you are covering three areas plus 17, you can participate in the overall ranking. If in a particular SDG you are missing some data, which yes. will often be the case, then yes, you would score lower than a university that had all of the data within the SDG. Well, potentially they may not score very well on the ones they do have data, but theoretically you would score lower. But we, we hope you would still consider participating. We do see this as a mechanism to encourage universities to move forward in these areas. Um, yes, we're interested in the outcomes from a purely analytical perspective, but we do think there is a positive feedback loop that when universities see that they can get some credit for doing this, it's a small part of an incentive to encourage them to do more and move forward. So um, we would hope that, uh, or we would love to get uh, many more universities from uh, countries such as Ghana uh, to participate. Um, so we would greatly appreciate your input. And my second question, please. Uh, sorry, what would remind me? Oh, sorry, I went too, on too long on your <laughs> question. Your second question was? It had to deal with the fact that we just got chartered in June of uh, 2018. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah so uh, again, um, I think the reality is that we, we do need evidence that you, when we're asking for policies, we do want evidence that you have policies. Now, okay. I think if you had a draft policy, we, we would be interested. I think, to be fair, we would... We would um, uh, we wouldn't be able to give, I don't think, full credit for a draft policy. Having said that, the end of the data collection window is December, so it still does give you time to think about some of the, uh, putting some of those policies in place. Got it. Thank you so and, much. And, and, congrats, and then, congratulations on 16 years, by the way. Oh, apologies for that. I think um, uh, I was accidentally muted there. Can you hear me now? Yep, excellent. So um, apologies for, for muting myself there. Uh, we do need to call the, um, the presentation to an end now because we, we've run over time. Um, thank you all so much for your participation. Um, we genuinely hope this, will, this new ranking will provide a very different insight into the outcomes that higher education is working towards. We do acknowledge that it won't be perfect, particularly in the first year, but we hope that you will be willing to participate. And by participation, I don't just mean submitting data, I also mean by providing input, advice, ideas to help us make this better in future years as well. So uh, final reminders, if you have any further questions, please do email us at innovation at timeshighereducation.com. Uh, and also a reminder that the slides from the webinar will be available soon and we will email out to the email addresses that you gave when you registered for the email. So uh, once more on behalf of Times Higher Education and Vertigo Ventures, thank you for your participation. Uh, we look forward to working with you in the future.